is that you it's not a get out of jail free card uh, if you're vaccinated. So you still have to engage in the same you know practices as you were before. You can do more things. You have a wider latitude, but the reality is that you still need to be mindful. Right. It's the same thing when a person goes and drives a car. Right. You want to make yourself as safe as possible while you're in the chassis of a vehicle. And that also entails, say, wearing a seatbelt so that if there is some type of uh, accident, when that you don't go careening out of the, uh, the windshield. So the same um, I guess, so I aspects had, apply. Uh, I had one lovely middle aged lady very bright and I asked her if she'd been vaccinated as I typically do when I expose myself to a patient and she said no I'm not taking it I said why she said well 44 percent of the people who get vaccinated die how would you have answered her I would have stated that that is simply false um, on its face I mean 44%, 44%, like where are the data validating that number? I mean, if there's a thing where, you know, like trust but verify, right? So uh, with that, I can't even trust it. So if a person says something, like they should be able to, you know, back it up. And that's the nature of empirical, you know, evidence and, and data. But the reality is that one thing we're seeing in the pandemic is that sometimes uh, people's beliefs are bulletproof to uh, evidence and data. Um, so, I mean, all you can tell her is that the purpose of getting vaccinated is in order to protect her and her loved ones and whatnot. And if the person still does not uh, budge, then you can't, you can't do anything else. I mean, like, at the end of the day, the person has to uh, make their own choices with their body. And so in my understanding, right now, more than 99% of the people being hospitalized and the people dying as a result of COVID are people who have not been vaccinated. That's my understanding. Of the people who have been vaccinated, there has been no specific set of deaths that have been linked directly to a cause and effect of taking a vaccine. Am I correct on that or any discussion on that, doctor? That would be a correct assertion, yes. Now, we do know that every day, according to actuarial tables, that a certain number of people die. It's called expected deaths. And no matter what, there are going to be so many people hit by a bus, so many people in a plane crash, and so many people that got bit by a dog. But that doesn't mean because you took a vaccine that day and walked out in the street and got hit by a bus, that that is a death caused by the vaccine. It's called true, true, but unrelated. That was a series of the types of tests that we had in medical school. Is that true, Dr. Dennis? Um, so further, Dr. Despanning, um, what is the other thing? People say that we don't know what's in the vaccine. Now, I have a flipping answer. You don't know what's in the strawberry jelly that you got from Whole Foods either, but you eat it. You don't know what is in that pill that Pfizer makes that's called Viagra, but you take it. What is in these mRNA vaccines and why are people concerned about them? Um, Yeah, the reality is that people are concerned about them because they don't actually understand the science. There's a difference between a person who is informed enough to be able to know where to go conduct the, you know, Google search and find the FDA website and look at what all the ingredients are. Uh, And then there's a difference between somebody who just does not, whenever you say something to them, they think you're talking in Greek or uh, Koine, yeah, Koine Greek or uh, classical Latin. So they just will not, you can't reach them, right? It's, but in in a way, and I've adopted a new approach 
to my patients. I try to go to them with understanding and gentleness. And even though it tries my patience, I, I bite my tongue a lot. But is there any chance of getting the COVID infection from the mRNA vaccine such as Pfizer and Moderna? No, no. The whole purpose of, a, of the vaccine is that it's basically trying to create an artificial like process of your body recognizing an aspect of the virus so that it doesn't, uh, whenever you, your body is actually prepared for whenever you uh, encounter the virus itself. So again, it's basically trying to protect you and alert your immune system beforehand. So I've likened the process of an mRNA virus like 3D printing. They uh, have mRNA vaccine. The code. They have broken the code and done a download of a picture and printed it. And that picture is able to establish a relationship with the body that is almost like an antigen or to provoke the creation of an antibody. Is that the right concept? Is that one way to look at it? Yeah, it is correct. Okay. So there is no virus particle, no virus material in the actual mRNA virus. Of the mRNA vaccine. Right. Now, what is the difference in an mRNA virus vaccine and the adenovirus vaccine is represented by J and J. Right. So the messenger RNA virus, uh, or now I'm confused, and <laughs> the, the messenger RNA vaccine basically consists of the instructions put inside a nanoparticle, which is a small little tiny ball of fat. Um, and then afterwards, once it's in your body, your body just reads it, uh, like the, the Xerox copy, and then it makes the spike protein, which is a protein that also is made by the virus itself. So basically, you're trying to give your, you know, cheat seat ahead uh, of an exam, right? And with the adenoviral vector, uh, on the other hand, that's a, uh, adenoviral vectors are common cold viruses that have actually been stripped of their guts and replaced with uh, a spike protein so that then whenever you do get that injection, it also does the same thing of uh, giving your body a cheat sheet so that it uh, is prepared for the exam when it uh, faces the real virus. Excellent, excellent. So now um, another controversy that has come up, it required initially two, vac two shots of the mRNA vaccines to get immunity but it was discovered that your immunity went down over the ensuing, ensuing months. So it was suggested that you might need a booster uh, to increase your uh, immune response with those. And so Pfizer has actually been granted an emergency use booster and Moderna has a, an application put in and it has also been found that even the J&J &J vaccine, which everybody thought was just going to be one shot, and a lot of people took that one shot. But are we going to need boosters for all of those and why? Um, mainly the boosters are necessary for people who are either frontline workers, uh, for people who have uh, pre-existing conditions, or people who have... Uh, that are immunocompromised, those are the most likely to need the uh, boosters. The reason why is because it's not a, nothing in life really is a zero or hundred percent uh, probability. So basically you have to realize that there are many factors going on, namely that your immune system has antibodies that do wane after a time. So in order to refresh or rejuvenate them, you give a booster shot. I mean, this is pretty standard. I mean, the people are often lulled into uh, complacency when they get the uh, MMR, uh, mumps, measles, and rubella um, vaccination. But the reality is that you get a, you're supposed to get a uh, influenza virus vaccine um, every year, right? Uh, and for many other types of vaccines, you require like three um, vaccinations. Case in point, whenever I was younger, I had the uh, uh, human papillomavirus vaccine from Merck, and that required three doses. So again, people 
tend to have short-term thinking or they just don't know is that's at the end of the day what it is like not every virus is going to be defeated just with like a one and done approach okay so in your opinion where are we with this pandemic some people have said that this pandemic will go down but it will be what we call an it will be endemically available in our community. What are your thoughts? I would agree with that uh, assertion. I mean, the it, to the best of my knowledge, we've only ever really eradicated two viruses in um, nature through human effort, and that was variola virus, also known as smallpox, and then also rinderpest, which I believe that is an animal virus. But uh, it's very difficult to eradicate uh, viruses. Part of the reason being is that they oftentimes have multiple hosts that they can hide in. And we know that the SARS coronavirus too um, can infect cats, dogs, uh, deer, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll always have a, have a reservoir in which to hide out and, you know, retool and uh, adapt itself. So the best that we can hope for at this point is to reach uh, the virus being endemic, which believe it or not, that has actually happened with other coronaviruses. Uh, there was a um, science is now leading us to believe that the Russian flu uh, pandemic, which happened in the uh, mid 1800s, was actually caused by a um, um, coronavirus. And the working theory now is that that was a pandemic in the 1800s. And then over the years, our body adapted to it. And now it's just a normal uh, denizen that it infects us maybe in wintertime. And that's that virus is called OC43. So we have four coronaviruses that infect us as humans, and they, you know, just cause common colds. So it's a process. Uh, I just heard a, something that's a near social tragedy that in the Northwest United States that where they have a lot of mink and the mink farms that the minks have been getting coronavirus and dying from it. So I know that's tragedy. Yes, yeah. The, <laughs> yeah, the minks actually, um, they were uh, for one of the variants. What happened is that Denmark had to cull uh, a large amount of minks because the virus was spreading through them. And that actually, I believe caused the, uh, one of the California variants. Um, I'm blanking on which uh, with the uh, the Greek uh, letter for I believe it was uh, I, either iota or kappa, one of those two. But yeah, it was probably kappa. <laughs> um, I had a conversation with a, a good friend of mine uh, just last night, and he had the uh, Pfizer vaccine. And another gentleman had had the J and J vaccine, and the question I'm going to ask is a little bit unfair because there's not real guidance yet. What about if you've had the Moderna vaccine? Can you get a Pfizer booster? Or if you've had the J and J vaccine, can or should you get a Moderna or Pfizer booster? Can all of these things be mixed and matched? And I know there's no official word yet, but I'm just asking you. Yeah, from a scientific perspective, what you're describing is a heterologous um, uh, priming, for lack of a better term, heterologous is just another term for mixing and matching, using different things. Um, and there was a study that was done in uh, 500 uh, patients. Uh, I was actually, or clinical uh, study subjects, I was actually discussing that with one of my uh, colleagues that we worked at Johns Hopkins Hospital uh, together. And um, it seems to be pretty uh, okay that it's uh, doing the, um, like, mix and match like does seem to work but again the, that sample size of 500 people is still pretty small to draw any um whole scale conclusions from so i mean it looks good it's like a yellow light right now but let's wait for uh, confirmation from the you know federal authorities um before we you know make any uh real assertions okay so there's data out that shows that more than 71 or 72 percent of Americans now are vaccinated with at least one shot. And there's been a significant decrease in infectious disease uh, among that group with them not suffering illness enough to have 
the need to be hospitalized and certainly not dying. From a statistical standpoint, where is the morbidity and mortality rate affecting communities and who are the people most likely to succumb to non-vaccination in your opinion? Uh, I would say that right now it's still in places that are uh, averse to getting the, the vaccine. I mean, you can actually plot it across like a map of the United States and the areas that tend to have the most uh, cases there are those that actually, you know, people are vaccine hesitant. And then secondly, the people that uh, are unvaccinated are most likely to uh, have a deleterious or untoward uh, side effects and whatnot, downstream uh, morbidities and eventually mortality would probably be those who, again, have pre-existing conditions that they either like, know about and are aware of or that they're not even cognizant of at all, right? Because there are things that, you know, there's, there's like a bucket approach where a person could, you know, like be very healthy and then like their immune system is tipped into like utter self-destruction just by being infected with the virus because it can cause a host of downstream um, events that are uh, not beneficial for the person. So yeah, it's the people who um, uh, that either already have pre-existing conditions or those who, um, you know, they never like anticipated anything would happen because we have seen like this virus waylay people who were once healthy and they were completely waylaid. So again, it's that's why it's always better to try to get uh, protection via vaccine as opposed to the actual virus, because you can't know whether you'll be the one who can survive. I have a slide that I use in one of my talks that I give both to physicians as well as to lay people. And it's on adipose tissue, fat tissue. In particular, fat tissue that is around your abdomen. Like there are two physiological groups of obese people. There are those who are shaped like an apple. And there are those who are shaped like a pear. The people shaped like an apple have fat around their midrib. The people shaped like a pear have a, a thin waist and a big booty. Now, research has shown that in those that have adipose or fat tissue in the intra-abdominal and subcutaneous area around the waist have a higher percentage of chance of dying of high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and all other causes. And one of the reasons is that fat makes about 50 different toxic substances, mostly hormones, including tumor necrosis factor, interleukin factor, which is part of the chain reaction that creates cytokines. So people who are obese have a dysfunctional immune system, even though we in our community sometimes think that being obese is just being fat and happy, it is actually a deadly disease. We also know that much of the food that we eat, especially young people and people in a hurry and many doctors who are too busy, we eat this fast food. And many, much of that is bereft of appropriate nutrients. What do you think some of the things that make people more liable or likely to be immunocompromised uh, and be, 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 and get this virus? What are some of the things, what are some of the health disparities that you know about and others that might lead to a compromised immune system? Oh, quite, quite a few actually. Uh, you can e easily uh, point to uh, lack of exercise. That's one of the quickest and best ways to, you know, boost your immune system, believe it or not. Uh, and that can just really be like walking every day and, and whatnot. It doesn't even have to be super vigorous activity. Another aspect is diet. Diet is the most important thing, as you pointed out. Um, and uh, really just being able to eat a good balanced uh, meal that actually contains fruits and vegetables are fairly 
critical um, to having a good immune system and a good body overall. Um, and then lastly, uh, I'd say managing, uh, well, not lastly, but managing stress. Um, cortisol it can be a you know, killer uh, if not managed. Uh, cortisol is a hormone that regulates and modulates and you know, stress. And then lastly would be um, having a good sleep um, uh, regimen, right? Because if you don't get sleep, then your body is really just walking around like a zombie because believe it or not, the, but studies have shown that when a person is asleep, that's when your immune system is really going about doing it. It's where getting those natural killer cells, those T cells, those B cells, just all, you know, ready for, you know, the next day's, you know, work, right? So my sleep is not just important for rejuvenating our brain, but just our body writ large. Yeah, I used to take care of a patient by the name of Dick Gregory for almost 40 years I was his doctor. And he would always say two of the most important things that people don't do is sleep enough and drink enough water. So sleep and hydration are extremely important. In that. But let's go back to the issue of stress. Many people say, I'm not stressed. I don't feel stressed. But we know that stress cannot always be determined by the person who is stressed. And we've had several talks in the past about ACEs, which stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And we've also had uh, things that happened in our life called structural racism and results of that. Everybody is stressed. And I maintain that people in communities of color may be unconsciously stressed because you cannot always feel it. And it does decrease your immune system. But let's find out, are there any questions in the chat? Simon, do you see any questions in the chat or Dr. Spanning? I don't see any as of yet. Just you know, comments like further buttressing um, our uh, statements. Okay, well, very, very good. Um, let's talk a moment about when we first started the calls on the Black Health Trust. My associate at that time uh, helped me come up with the topic that we need to Dr. Jesse Surratt, who is a Harvard educated physician uh, with training in infectious disease and epidemiology. But we talked a lot about nutrition and we talked about. Uh, the agents that are in things like prenatal vitamins, because they have all of the essential uh, elements that you need. And I joke, well, I'm not pregnant, but I take prenatal vitamins as well. Uh, we talked about taking things such as zinc and selenium, and we talked about taking uh, vitamin D. And the prescription that I've been giving people when I think they're immunocompromised and extremely exposed to 50,000 international units of vitamin D3 per week for four weeks and then dropping down uh, to 5,000, either 2,500 or 5,000 per day. And that was also backed up by Dr. Susan uh, Can you talk just a moment about your thoughts about? approaches to nutrition in your training as a pharmacist and so I would hope that people should look to. Yes. I would definitely say that the most important thing would actually be uh, that uh, if possible, try to actually get your uh, your nutrients through actual food itself. Because I mean, the thing is that a person can get a supplement, but the supplement it's just superior to get your food through, uh, like, or get your nutrients through the actual food. For instance, for vitamin D, one can actually um, increase their vitamin D levels by, say, having like yogurt. Like, you know, that, that, that vitamin, uh, vitamin D is uh, uh, abundant in uh, in yogurt. Another thing, believe it or not, is that uh, uh, mushrooms, uh, believe it or not, have large amounts of uh, of vitamin D. Um, yeah, really, it's just about having like a balanced. Um, diet really that again includes the vegetables and fruits and fiber um like for instance say substituting instead of uh white rice say substituting that with 
brown rice or if you're even really more intrepid try red rice or even black rice um what's one thing that's really good and that i'm a uh, fierce uh, exponent of is actually eating like dark foods like say uh, purple cauliflower or uh, red uh, red onions or um um what was the other uh, radishes and whatnot. So one, the reason why is because when you have those red or purple colors uh, in nature, that's telling you that that is super, super, super healthy. The reason why is because um, they produce uh, various antioxidants that are just beneficial for you. And antioxidants, again, are those anti-aging, like they basically like scavenge, um, like, what are called reactive oxygen species. And basically if you have like these things, uh, these ROSs going around in your body, they're just like, you know, attacking your, your body and they're not being uh, stopped. So again, that's why you really want to try to focus on eating things that are like, like not only leafy or dark uh, green, but also like red, purple, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I saw an interesting cartoon some years ago talking about how reactive oxygen species can be produced by processed food like bread. And the cartoon was one of James Bond. He said, well, knowing that, I should have more martinis and less bread. But we know that colored foods, we're advised to eat the colors red, green, blue, and not eat things that are necessarily white in color. And I'm not being uh, political, but colored things are better in your diet as Dr. Despani said. Uh, but let's go back to this stress thing and this reactive oxygen species. We know that the blood vessels in the body their inside lining is something called the endothelium. And we know that this endothelium, if you took all the cells lining all the blood vessels in the body, it would cover an average of six to seven tennis courts for the average sized person. So that's a pretty huge organ. And we know that this endothelium uh, is where we have the ACE2 receptors. We know also that this endothelium controls vascular health, vasoconstriction, and it also controls what happens with uh, cholesterol and plaques. We also know it affects blood clotting. And all these things have to do with what we know are some of the side effects of both the COVID and also some of the potential rare side effects that happen uh, with uh, an occasional vaccine. But in that picture, and I don't mean to ambush you, how, what are some of the ways that we can better care for our endothelium and endothelial health? And I'm speaking about some of the things that are in green leafy vegetables, in the prenatal vitamins and things that produce nitric oxide. Yeah, that's uh, very uh, you know important. Uh, yeah, just uh, I would say in terms of foods, uh, just heart healthy things. Uh, one thing that people often forget is that whenever you're looking at health, you also have to look at the prism of uh, biology and also history. Uh, for thousands of years, humans alternated between um, eating meat that they hunted um, and alternatively, whenever they couldn't uh, find enough game to hunt, they actually just went and they scavenged uh, berries and fruits and, you know, like other vegetables and whatnot. And a sort of symbiotic relationship developed between humans and plants because plants need humans to eat them and then spread the seeds further than the plant itself could go. And conversely, the plants um, release or have like a multitude of different uh, healthy uh, products and, and whatnot that actually help our body just really do its job that much better. Um, I mean, one thing, for instance, that I am a big exponent of is extra virgin olive oil. Um, 
just very, very important and it's uh, renowned throughout the Mediterranean region. So um, very big exponent of the Mediterranean diet. So that's something that has actually been demonstrated clinically for decades to actually be able to, uh, you know, fight off uh, aging and also just promote heart health. Um, and again, we have to go back to the, um, in terms of managing stress, we have to go back to managing um, to uh, like any hardships and then also exercising. Because another aspect that needs to be taken into consideration is that stress is really an inner interplay of the mind and the body. So that's called psychosomatic. So believe it or not, but the person's mental state can sometimes influence their, um, their, their health. Uh, case in point, whenever I'm uh, stressed out mentally with all kinds of crazy things, I actually just randomly uh, just get uh, uh, what I call it, I think the uh, aphytis uh, uh, ulcers, or they just show up, you know, for no reason uh, whatsoever, like on my tongue you know, and whatnot. And uh, it's a very painful thing, but yeah, your stress can uh, influence your body and uh, your body can influence your mind too and uh, whatnot. So uh, it's just being mindful of that interplay. So that leads me to two topics, which are strange, but I'm going to speak about them and invite you to one is the role that faith can play in stress. But before that, I want to discuss the microbiome. And we know that the microbiome is a friendly bacterial colonization of our gut and our body. And there are some theories that think that the human body is a, a hotel for both friendly bacteria, friendly uh, fungus, along with our human cells. But we know that that microbiome, in many cases, secretes hormones that affect your brain, expect your mental, your mental health, such as serotonin, and we know that that can be a factor in depression, can be a factor in stress. So again, eating the correct thing uh, does reflect how it can affect your mental state and how vulnerable you are to these effects of stress. I don't know if you want to comment on that, on how eating things like yogurt, probiotics, prebiotics, can be helpful in your mental health and fight against stress. Of course, yeah, as you know, I'm a, I consider myself a Renaissance man, so I always wanna comment on a myriad of things. So uh, with regards to that, just to provide uh, an actual statistic behind one of your earlier um, suppositions, yeah, uh, we've deduced that uh, uh, the amount of microbes on the human body outnumber human cells 10 to one. So for every one human cell, there's like, you know, a 10, a log scale more, uh, you know. So that's saying we're, we're, we're mostly bacteria? Yes, yeah. So it's basically, we're at the end of the day, we're a super organism, uh, which basically is when you have like a multitude of things working in tandem and you actually want that to be the case. The reason why is because there are many things that you, your body takes in that it can't actually like process, like a lot of fiber and whatnot. It's pretty tough to go through. It's the same thing even with, uh, say, like beans uh, and whatnot. That's why sometimes when people take, uh, you know, eat beans and whatnot, it's just like, oh, okay, like, yeah, this is not passing through like so easily and whatnot. And it's just like, yeah, because it needs to be really fermented in your, uh, your small and large intestine um, and intestines. And then, um, yeah. It's just really uh, critical to be able to uh, feed that uh, microbiome because, um, yeah, the, it's really like critical, right? I mean, the like eating yogurt is not only important for the vitamin D, but also because again, those probiotics are like fuel for the uh, well, not only fuel for, but actually like it helps with colonization of your uh, gut because there's such a problem where a child doesn't have enough. Um, uh, bacteria in its um, body. I mean, you can also have too much uh, bacteria. 
And another thing I would like to emphasize as we are amidst the viral pandemic is that there actually are good viruses as well. People only focus on the bad ones like herpes simplex virus one and two or SARS coronavirus two and whatnot, but a person would not actually be a human without a virus that actually gave human women the ability to carry their young in the womb. Probably one of our mammalian ancestors, but uh, a basic uh, ancestral version of HIV is what allows uh, humans to carry their young to term in their you know bellies uh, by downregulating the mother's immune system. So yeah, I mean the human genome, seven percent of it is uh, made of viruses. So it's yeah, I mean it's a very kaleidoscopic view of uh, microbiology and virology and etiquetoro. So um, but Dr. Despani, does that mean and does that play into the fact that we know that the statistics for pregnant women uh, getting more ill from the virus, the COVID-19, is because their immune system has been dialed back genetically. Mm, I wouldn't, I, I would not make that assertion without being able to see the data uh, per se, but- um, there, yeah. is, there is CDC data out now showing that unvaccinated pregnant women do have an increased hospitalization, increased risk of death. This is a fact I mm -hmm. reviewed that this morning. Mm -hmm. But I hadn't looked at the genetic teleological fact that you just brought up about the virus being, not a virus, being potentially responsible for that in history. Yes, some, some, yeah, sometimes. So those are called human endogenous retroviruses. Um, those, uh, there are studies that can't link them to things like multiple sclerosis and whatnot, but I feel that the direct research linking like SARS coronavirus 2 to say human endogenous retroviruses that exist in your genome, um, there has not yet been a study of that nature. But that said, a person should be mindful of the fact that women naturally have more uh, active immune systems uh, than uh, males do. And that is part of the reason why the overwhelming majority of uh, autoimmune diseases are um, found to occur in women. Interesting, interesting. I'd like, uh, if Dr. Jordan is available, can you comment on that? Dr. Jordan is infectious disease virology as well. He's one of our medical advisors. That's interesting to me. I'm here. Hello, sir. And I'll admit that you are my mentor. <laughs> An elder. We got to have a discussion about this elder issue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm going to throw age on you for a moment. Do you remember when you were a little boy, one of the very popular songs was about beans and cornbread having a fight. Bean knocked cornbread out of sight. Cornbread said, well, that's all right. I'll meet you around the corner next Saturday night. And that was in reference to most of what we all ate then we were poor was eating great northern beans, other kind of beans, and cornbread, and causing gas. And that's, so we had songs about those things then. So Dr. Hispanic sort of has painted this very well. Not too much more I can say. The only thing I want to add is the next piece in terms of emotion. I think we have played down, or we have planned down too much the role that the church has played in terms of our mental health. Because we forget most black people didn't have access to a psychiatrist probably until the 60s. I was born in Arkansas in the back room of our house and my folks were very middle class, but blacks couldn't go to neither of the hospitals in either the town 20 miles away or the town five miles away. Everybody had their babies at home or sometimes at church. Uh, and most folks who had any kind of stress, I mean, you could I mean, there's a correlation as to how much stress you are enduring every day and what denomination you rent. Because the more stress you needed to deal with, meaning you needed to dance, shout, scream, dictated what church you were going to go to. Uh, we sort of ignore those things now, but 
that's a part of our history. I think it's very important in that, and I'm not on this program going to endorse a, a particular approach or denomination, but it seems like to me, successful societies and cultures and in my own mental success, I think I'm saying, can't be sure, but I think I am. I do have a, what I consider a spiritual anchor, mm -hmm. something that I can anchor on. And when I, I happen to be a Christian and in my uh, language and worship, I say the Lord's prayer and I acknowledge the omnipotence of God. That means that I recognize that there's something that I can anchor myself to and that has a, a, a good effect on my ability to undergo threats and other things and that's part of my mental health. We have a Dr. Gary Dennis is on. Dr. You, you, I know you're not a psychiatrist but you're a, a brain surgeon. Would you comment on these issues we're talking about, sir? Can we make sure Dr. Dennis can unmute? Simon, do you see Dr. Dennis? Okay, I guess he can't. Um, but I think mental health is a, a big, portion of, of what we are dealing with. Spiritual health is also another one. The other uh, challenge that we have, uh, Dr. Despani and also Dr. Jordan, is that we've had so much misinformation out here that even those of us who think and believe that we are messengers that need to be trusted because we come from the community and we've taken the time to study and become well-versed on these things, but there's still a lot of things working against us. How do I best approach the middle-aged lady that I spoke about who told me that 44% of those who get the vaccine die. And I didn't want to shame her. And I can't tell her that she's ignorant to a degree, but how do we redirect people in a respectful way? And my mother always told me, you can get more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. Any comments on that? Yeah, for me, I tell patients I've had the vaccine. First of all, I would I would correct her, not initially, but before our conversation ended, I'd reassure her and let her understand she's misunderstood something. But I think it's important for us to be able to do a first person. You know, that's 44%. No, that's not. I think what you heard is something, but not that uh, I've had the vaccine, it caused me problems. You, Randall, you know it caused me problems because you even called me up to ask me, what's wrong with you? <laughs> uh, but that's not a reason to not take it. I'd rather have had it and had that problem than to take the chance of getting corona and dying. 44% uh, of people who've had the vaccine did not die of COVID. I mean, that's totally incorrect. But I think, again, it, that comes to your involvement in the community, the person's feeling that you are a part of and feeling safe, as opposed to someone walking into a place, asking a person, and not having any idea of who you are, what you've done, et cetera. I think this is where the whole health, Black Health Trust is important. It isn't just that it's the Black Health Trust, but hope that when people look at it, they can see people whom they can identify with and trust. And trust comes from not necessarily knowing you this time, 
a trust comes from the fact that I've known you since Moses parted the Red Sea. And that's why I can trust you. And I think that's for true for most folks. They need to have a history. And I think we have failed in some sense of not providing enough history with a lot of our patients. They just come in, see us and leave. And that's not good, but I don't care what ethnic group we're from, et cetera. We, we need to be a part of the community. And I think what Black Health Trust has done and what some of us are doing, you're part of the community. And they can say things. Uh, I see Dr. Ernest Smith sitting there, grouchy as usual, but I can say that because I know him. But I mean, I can't say that if I didn't know him. Uh, and knowing him, he knows my record in the community. I, I think it's important that we establish some tentacles in our community. It just can be a dark skin. But someone has to be able to say, yes, he or she is doing something in their community. And a, a lot, not all, but some of us really have no community. I have no connection in, in, in our community. And that makes it hard. And this is a time we need to. Okay. Um, are there any comments or questions in the chat that we need to address? Yes, no. I have a comment, but it's not in the chat. Okay. Uh, we've had lately three women come to the clinic, to my office, with AIDS, not HIV. Uh, and I gave a talk two days ago about it, and it just crystallized the idea. We need to also be doing things to get physicians. Black women need to be tested. Test one time to see that you're HIV positive or not. Uh, if you're not, that's fine. You don't need to be tested over and over and over. But we still have too many Black women, HIV positive, not finding out until their T-cell counts have fallen way below 200. And that's hard as hell to rebuild that immune system. Uh, and they will go through a whole mental thing because all of these women, none of them saw themselves as being at risk. I mean, that is the biggest problem. Most, most women do not see themselves as being at risk. Men do. If I'm a drug user, whether I'm a woman or a man, I know what I'm doing. I know I should go get tested. But if I'm a heterosexual woman involved with one man, or even two or three men, I don't see myself as being at risk. I don't see them as being involved with men. Yet, that happens. And I think we need to look at what we can do, at least get doctors to test their patients, get women to go get a test once so you know for sure. I don't think people need to get tested every year, but it would be great if every woman was tested at least once so she could know, because all of these women had never had a test until now. And they all should have had a test five to seven years ago. And, and I think it, that's another issue. We, we still, it hasn't gone away and we need to deal with it because basically all we're doing is keeping them from getting, from having a good life. I think those are very important points that you bring up. Uh, I want to see if I can't share my uh, screen again. Is this your, okay. I, I don't know what the hell this was. Okay. So, oh, your COVID data track. Okay. Yeah. So I'm interested in people knowing where to go for data. So if you type into your browser, COVID data tracker or CDC data tracker, it will give you all these statistics uh, that are uh, on, um, on COVID and it's, it's good information that we want you to use. And it is a valid source of data. 
and you can actually pick up uh, pediatric data on about children, what's the status of their immunity, who's dying, we can look at the vaccinations, uh, but I want us to be more computer savvy and use these uh, various uh, websites that are available. Uh, so I won't spend time on it too much, but let me look at one more. So CDC stands for Center Disease Control. And uh, and there's a lot of information about the science, about the agenda, a weekly review, uh, science briefs, uh, forecasting what's going to happen. There's the variant surveillance, the epidemiology, and I encourage everybody to use this as a primary uh, insight uh, into this disease. Uh, Here's guidance, for example, on the COVID variants to maximize protection from the Delta variant and prevent possibly spreading vaccination, be vaccinated as soon as you can and wear a mask indoors in public. So we haven't mentioned masks, but we do believe that masks are very valuable. Dr. Spani, can you comment on how that can be useful? Yeah, but of course, yeah, you know, the reality with masks is that there's simply a barrier between the virus and your uh, airways. So again, having a, a mask is, you know, is a very low cost way of protecting yourself. Again, it's like providing yourself with multiple layers of protection, right? It's the same way that whenever you go outside, you don't go stark naked, rather you wear, you know, pants, you wear um, a shirt, et cetera, et cetera, to protect yourself against elements. It's a similar, um, you know, analog here. Um, I mean, the, this is something, believe it or not, that has been culturally ingrained in Asian societies after the 2002 to 2003 SARS coronavirus one pandemic, where they already need to mask up. And that actually plays a large role in why, for instance, like Taiwan has like a low rate of infection is that they're not only doing um, contact tracing, but they're masking up their um, engaging in social distancing and they're vaccinating their population. Um, it's just kind of a, a simple low cost way of protecting oneself. It works. Yeah, uh, um, one thing, one thing, Dr. Maxi, uh, will we uh, talk about uh, the antiviral uh, drugs? Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, recently there was um, some excellent data from uh, Merck that was submitted to the FDA stating that their molnupiravir uh, was actually uh, capable of uh, reducing the time of a SARS coronavirus 2 early infection um, by 50%. So that's basically reducing the time that a person who gets infected uh, actually has to go through all the uh, the horrible uh, consequences of uh, infection. So the FDA is um, going to be looking at that and that will provide another tool in our armamentarium to fight against the, the virus. Now, monopiravir basically is a drug that actually is, can be taken uh, just by mouth. And like, what it does is it actually, it's kind of like, um, let's say you have a, um, fake Legos. So what the virus does is that the virus um, uses what's called RNA dependent RNA polymerase in order to use all of its uh, nucleotides, which are the building blocks in order to make new uh, viruses uh, so that you know, it can spread during an infection. But what monopiravir does is that it actually places, it, it, it actually, the molecule uh, integrates into the growing um, uh, virus as it's replicating and it causes it to stutter. It can't like move forward and uh, continuing to replicate and make more of the virus. And then the whole structure just falls apart as the virus is being built. So basically it's kind of like a, you know, tearing things down like a, a bulldozer from within, right? So uh, that is part of the reason why it's so successful uh, compared to the other uh, small molecule drugs that have been bandied about. And um, things are looking pretty well. I mean, the FDA was very confident 
and they actually cut their uh, their study short because the it was just overwhelming how uh, how effective the drug was. So that would be something that like not as a substitute for vaccination, but a complement to vaccination. Like let's say a person had gotten vaccinated and then they still, I mean, even if you got vaccinated, you probably would only have a mild infection, but let's say somebody wasn't, uh, didn't want to get the vaccine and they're at a risk of developing a serious infection where they'll need to uh, you know, go to the uh, ICU and whatnot, being able to uh, get infected and then take this medication will probably reduce the chances by half that a person would even need to go to the hospital if taken soon enough. So that's, um, that's a ray of good hope. Um, because again, we need as many tools as possible. Uh, speaking of tools, I'm going to ask Mr. Uh, Dorsey to get that. He has a two minute video. And the topic that I have up is cleaning and disinfecting facilities. So this would go for homes, schools, offices, and whatnot. Um, and we have a product that we're using to help endorse what we're talking about. And it's called Active Pure. And we think the product is efficacious. We think it works. We know it works. And we know that uh, uh, for people who buy it, that they can get discounts. And if people from this call buy it, uh, it will benefit the sponsoring of the Black Health Trust. Mr. Herb Dorsey, can you unmute yourself? And I would like to show that two minute video. If not, I'd like you to be able to speak for about a minute on Active Pure because I want to make that available. Yes, sir. Are yes, you sir. able to show the sure. video from your side? So you do it. Uh, it is in the chat. Uh, let me see here. It can be in the chat. Dr. Dennis, were you ever to able to figure out how to get unmuted yet? Can you hear me? Yes. While Mr. Dorsey is getting that video together, we had wanted you to comment on the effects of the microbiome uh, on stress and emotion and mental health. I know you're a surgeon and use a knife, but that's your area. Mm -hmm. well, that expresses the extent of a two-dimensional... Go ahead, Dr. Dennis. Okay, yeah, well, actually, it's this very complex in terms of what effect the virus has on mental health as well as neurological health. The um, problem that we have with patients listening to us and following our advice is one, because they either don't trust us or they don't know us. And it comes back to the same thing. Trust is, is really a critical piece of the puzzle. And, and without that, the patients are really not going to listen to anybody. It, it's, it's clear that that doesn't just go for people who don't have a science background. I mean, I know a lot of doctors that are avoiding being tested and avoiding getting vaccines because of some problem they may have had in the past that has nothing to do with their immunity for COVID. So uh, somehow we have to reemphasize the importance of taking these vaccines when they become available, as well as using this as a teaching moment for the patients. And I think that, that both of those are, are good points to keep in mind. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Dennis. He was former Chief of Neurosurgery at Howard University. And uh, I like to remark that he was Chief of Neurosurgery at age 30. I don't understand how he did it. He must have started medical school at about six years old. Uh, Mr. Dorsey. Yes, sir. 
We have it. It is playing in the background now, but I don't know how to share. You have share screen. Simon can let him share a screen. This is a two minute video, right? Correct. Simon, can we let Mr. Dorsey share his screen? Uh, barring that, uh, you can speak for one minute on that product, please. Uh, Doc, I dropped into the chat box my contact information, also the information that uh, we will be sharing uh, and, and discounts. You're getting a lot of feedback. Okay. Hang on. You signed on twice. Turn off your microphone on one of them. Go ahead. Okay, we're coming close to the top of the hour and our time is limited. Mr. Dorsey, can you come on real quick? Is this better? Go ahead. Okay, uh, I put in the chat box uh, the contact information uh, for Active Cure and also the uh, what we discussed in terms of uh, being a sharing situation with uh, the Black Health Trust. Let me ask you a few questions. What is Active Okay. Cure? What does it do? What does it actually do? Active Pure is a science based uh, NASA developed technology that denatures viruses, mold, uh, contaminants in the air, allergens, both so, in the air and on surfaces so within actually, minutes. So it actually gets into the room and destroys viruses. Is that correct? That is correct. It works on the principle of the uh, the same air principle that uh, you smell popcorn instantly uh, uh, at the farthest point of your house when you're popping it in the kitchen. It distributes molecules that have been uh, adjusted and, and uh, infused with ultraviolet light at 1200 feet per second throughout your, your location. So it's better than just a HEPA filter. Uh, a HEPA filter is a, uh, uh, it works 180% opposite from a health, HEPA filter. A HEPA filter, you are dependent on that virus uh, or contaminant being transferred to that one source, which then you depend on it to eliminate the virus or what are the contaminants. This technology takes the moisture in the air, it infuses it with ultraviolet light, and it sends it out on a search and destroy mission. It's similar to uh, uh, a HEPA filter would be like having a mouse trap set in the middle of your room. Uh, this technology would be like releasing a thousand cats in the room to catch the mouse. Well, thank you for that. We're getting close to the top of the hour. I noticed that one of our uh, super consultants, who is the new chief of anesthesiology at University of Virginia, Dr. Coombs on, and I know who your companion is with you, Dr. Coombs. She should be traveling with Dr. Barbara Nabert, but somewhere between Georgia and Florida. Hi, uh, Dr. Maxi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Thank you. I just tuned in. So you had a question for me? I had a question that uh, we know that you're the new chief of anesthesiology at a major medical school. And we'd like to hear some of your comments on how these vaccines and how the CDC is giving guidance for us to protect ourselves and our community, just like you. And also, I tell people that you used to be in charge of the group that was in charge of the New England Journal of Medicine, am I correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. So, so we are doing our best to increase the percentage of vaccinated employees. And re recently, the CEO of the healthcare system did issue the mandate and decided to go with mandated healthcare workers being vaccinated. 
Uh, needless to say, there were several in, within the population of healthcare workers who elected not to be vaccinated, a very, very small percentage. But as we uh, go in, uh, into this uncharted territory, it is going to make a difference with the adequacy of the workforce for those who elect not to be vaccinated. And these are people who elect not to be vaccinated, not for medical reasons. Um, so that's a whole nother issue. Uh, we are working hard to get the most recent uh, uh, data regarding um, the booster for Pfizer. We have probably somewhere uh, between a third and maybe 40% of our Moderna um, who received Moderna on their initial um, vaccinations. So we're, we're waiting for um, a final endorsement of where we go next with those group of patients. But the CEO uh, has actually encouraged people to get their boosters from local stores, such as CVS and Walgreens and the like. So I think um, we are on the downhill slope of our COVID rise. Virginia has, at least middle central Virginia has not experienced what other states have experienced. And as you know, we have a physician as governor and he's been very conservative on the, from the very beginning. I think that has made a big difference with healthcare systems within and Virginia. And the Northern region has a uh, parallel DC more than the central region, but we are uh, at a place where we're considering removing the ban for travel for um, healthcare workers. And um, we understand that other states have already removed the ban, but we actually have a ban that healthcare workers cannot be inside convention um, halls with you know the mass uh, group of people, the 1,000 and 2,000 people that were historically used to. So uh, I think they're, they have a multi-pronged approach to uh, COVID and it's been good. This round we had a lot less uh, mortality with the intubated patients, our earlier interventions. We have uh, protocols that are well learned. Uh, they are implemented on arrival and um, it, it is a good place to be in central Virginia if you have COVID. Uh, recently, we've heard of even places in Boston uh, because of refusal of vaccination amongst families where a family member suffers adversely within the same family, you have people who are advocating um, aggressive vaccination. So this is all a cultural adaptation for people to do what's right. Uh, but there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of trepidation, um, but we're trying to work through that. And I think the more we talk about it, I got an email from one of the members of the church I attended in Boston, should I take the vaccine? And I kindly told him that I was in a situation where uh, on, on the second wave, I actually had to speak to uh, a patient's uh, loved one regarding where he was on the ventilator and he was about to die. And we took an iPad in so that his loved one could actually talk to him, even though he was not conscious. And I explained that story to him. I think people are persuaded by stories. The more stories we tell, hopefully we can persuade people. Simple stories that are credible, that can convince people, and they have stickiness so that people will think a second time when it comes to taking the vaccination. So thank you, Dr. Rando. Thank you thank so you. much. Is, is my colleague with you? She, she just happens to be right here. Dr. Neighbor Stevens is right here. Hello, Dr. Neighbor Stevens. Good afternoon, Dr. Randall Maxey. How are you? I'm good. Love you to have a, a brief comment. We're almost at the time we sign off, but we couldn't do it without you saying hello. Hello, and remember to use common sense. Put on those masks, get your vaccinations, get your boosters, use your common sense. Hmm. And I know that Dr. Ivan Walks is in Mississippi uh, mm -hmm. celebrating his mother-in-law's 100th birthday. And I also see Admiral David Brewer, who is with his 100-plus-year-old mother. He is a former three-star admiral who handled all the logistics for the U.S. Navy, including the hospital ships, the uh, comfort, and the mercy. Dr. Brewer, are you there? Yeah. I'm here, how you doing? I'm doing good. You have a word of health and about the concoction that you make that you haven't sent me yet. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm hooking it up right now. I'm doing my elderberry syrup recipe. Uh, my mother just went in for her semi-annual uh, checkup. 
and all systems are go, no problems at all. And how old is uh, she? I know you she's don't have to one. 101. 101. So she drank, uh, you know, I you were talking about pigments, and uh, I have a purple passion smoothie with acai pulp, uh, wild blueberries, uh, purple sweet potatoes, and, um, and uh, yeah, purple sweet potatoes, wild blueberries, so dark grapes, and acai pulp. Uh, and that is a tremendous antioxidant combination. Uh, purple sweet potatoes have 150 percent more antioxidants than blueberries. So, so that's that's where we are right now, and uh, we're doing well. Green tea, cooked mushrooms daily for the ladies. 89 percent reduced risk of breast cancer. Well, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And I'd like to give my greatest thanks and ask him to have one final word to Dr. Despani, who helped me get through this with excellent information. Uh, Dr. Despani, we sure appreciate you and love you for being a part of the Black Health Trust. Any final comments? Yeah, no, I mean, it's just um, let us continue doing what we have been doing uh, before. And the Black Health Trust has really been at the vanguard of educating the Black community and how to navigate this often tumultuous time period. But we are on the uh, way towards the end. I mean, it's just a matter of uh, staying the course and we can all do this together. Okay, and I have special thanks for Simon, who's our technical director for making this call happen. Uh, his uh, relative and, and uncle did not know how to start the Zoom call, but he made it happen. Thank you, Simon. Have a good day, everybody. Enjoy and be safe and use common sense. Thank you, Simon.
See, you're still on. See, and you're talking. See this? You didn't come out. See your picture there? Yeah, it's a very nice picture. I know, but it means you're still on it. Right. In fact, the person knocked you out altogether. <laughs> 